If you're a new author and want to know how to read to a group of children, then this video is for you. Hi, my name is Jules and I write and illustrate books for children. I also make videos on drawing, planning and publishing every Friday. So make sure you subscribe and ding the bell next to it for all of my uploads. I am sure you'll find it helpful. I know when I first started, the idea of reading to a group of small children filled me with dread. When I showed one of my first book ideas to an author friend of mine, she said, why don't you go into a school and read to some of the children there? I smiled politely, but really inside I was thinking I'd rather staple gun my legs to the floor, quite frankly. It was only after having my own children and reading to them every day and at night time when, when they went to bed that I really began to get to grips with what it meant to be reading to children. So by me selflessly having children, it saved you the trauma of having to go into a group of children unprepared without these tips and tricks that I'm about to show you. No need to take. Let's jump in to tip number one. Decide on which book you're going to read. If you only have one book, well, read that one. Make sure you know it really well and which age group it is going to suit. This is much easier to manage if you're going into school because you should know which year groups or class sizes and ages that you're going to be with. However, if you're going into a library, you might have anything from babies turn up to teenagers. So when you make your booking with the library, make sure that they put on the poster or your social media, wherever you're going to be advertising it, the age range that it's suitable for. This doesn't mean that older children or younger children won't turn up though. So be prepared. If they do turn up and you've got say a picture book and you've got a bunch of leery teenagers turn up, then make sure that you can adjust your reading style to them. If you've got an older book and you've got younger children turn up, then you may need to pare down what you're going to be reading to them. But conversely, if you've got um, older children turn up, then you can sort of go back to the nostalgia of what it was like when they were children. What did they enjoy reading when they were little? Even 10 year olds like nostalgia. Right at the beginning of the session, make sure you introduce yourself as the author of the book. Otherwise, if you're in school, they might just think you're a stand-in teacher, and if you're in the library, they might think you work there. Explain what it means to be an author and illustrator, and ask them if they would like to do something like that when they're older. This is also the time to introduce your book, the title, and what's it about. You will need to allow about 15 to 20 minutes for the reading of the book. That's about as long as most children can manage to keep fidgeting at bay. The children in your group will have varying abilities to focus, so you need to allow for that. And if you've got a group who find it hard to sit and listen, then read your group a little bit and, and sort of speed things along a bit if you can. One easy way to keep them engaged is to keep referring the story back to them. So asking them questions about it or asking them what might happen next. That brings us on to number four. Ask your group questions. Engage them in the process of the story. Ask, why do you think Fidget did that? Or can anyone see a badger in the picture? This is a great way to keep the energy in the room dynamic enough to stop someone saying, I'm bored. But you have to read that energy to make sure it's not becoming too lively. If everyone is trying to say something or they're all trying to point at something on your book, then you need to bring that energy down a bit and just key it back a little bit. One easy way of doing that is to politely and with a really nice voice, shut the book and say, right, everyone sit down because we can't hear each other if we're all talking at once don't open the book until they're all sitting down. Another way to keep that energy a little bit lower is to ask individual children a question. Or, you know, would you like to come and see if you can point out where the moon is? Another tip if you're in school is to get the teacher to nominate the children because they will know which children are likely to be able to answer questions or ask good questions. They know the children really well. Tip number five, be expressive. Children don't want to listen to a monotonous ramble. It's boring. If you have the opportunity to put on a silly voice or do a funny walk, then do it. 
You don't have to sit on a chair the whole time. If you've got the space, get up and move around. Point things out in the book that you particularly like or things in the illustration that aren't referenced in the text. I sometimes tell my groups little illustrator secrets, things that nobody else really knows or understands about the process of making those things. It's a great way of creating that feeling of unity, it's sort of you and them together, know this thing. For someone starting out, it's easy to forget who your focus should be on. Your centre of attention should be the children. To start with, forget about the grown-ups. Connect to your inner child again. Remember what it's like to be that age. What did you find funny or interesting or what captured your imagination? When you get really adept at holding the attention of the children, then you can bring in the adults too if you feel brave enough. They are, after all, really important because they are the people who are going to be spending their money to buy your book. Make sure you know your book. Anticipate what children might say or ask about it. This partly comes with a bit of practice. So after your first few outings with your new book, you will begin to get a feel for what it is that children are going to pick up on. If your book has a difficult theme, say bullying, make sure you investigate what advice professional bodies and organisations give about that. The last thing you want to do is give bad advice. And if a child asks you a question that you don't know the answer to, just tell them the truth that you don't know. At the end of the sessions I run, I do one of two things. At schools, I do a question and answer session. It's usually best to ask the school to discuss this before you come so that the children have time to think of any good questions. If that hasn't been done, then ask the teacher to nominate the children who they think might be able to ask a good question, or the teacher can ask questions themselves. And sometimes, if I've done something like this and I'm faced with a row of blank faces, quite clearly not going to ask me any questions, then I feed them questions. Like, for example, my most common ones are, which is your favourite book? Or, how long does it take you to write a book? So I might suggest to them that, oh, other children in other schools have asked me this. How about, you know, is there anybody who wants to ask anything else? If I still get a row of blank faces, then I will ask them something that they can all answer. Like, what are you having for dinner tonight? Or, what do you want to be when you grow up? It's just a question of getting that conversation started. Sometimes you might be asked a bizarre or embarrassing question, like, why do you like your hair like that? Or, how are babies made? You're just gonna have to roll with it and find your own strategy. For the first question, I might say something like, hmm, well, I thought it was a good idea when I got up this morning. And then, do you always do your hair the same way? So deflecting that question back to them. The second sort of question, then I would suggest that they need to ask their teacher that when they go back to the classroom. The other thing that I might do if I'm in a library setting or in a festival is run a craft session after the book reading that is related to that book. For example, Fidget is about a fussy eating owl. So after we've read the story, we make a paper pizza and cook it in my cardboard pizza oven. This is great because it gives a very definitive end to the session. It gives the children something to take home and also something to remember you by. In your introduction to the session, then you can tell the children what they are going to be doing after you've read the book. So it's something else to look forward to. And it's also a really good idea for any of your children who are on the autistic spectrum or who have ADHD. It just kind of builds in that thing of, this is what's gonna happen now and that's what's gonna happen afterwards. If you have a library or a school visit booked, then you should expect your teacher teaching assistant or librarian to be there at all times. They ought to be there to control any unruly behaviour as well as fending questions like can I go to the toilet or I feel sick. Before you visit make sure you find out what the teacher or the librarian's name is and then you can send them your author pack. This will set out what you expect of them and what they can expect of you. I have one on my website which I will download into a link below that you can print off and use. On the odd occasion I have been to schools where the teacher will sit at the back of the class marking work completely ignoring me and basically allowing me to control and look after 30 six-year-olds. This is not okay. As an author, you're probably not a trained teacher and it's not your job to tell them off if they act up. 
If this happens, you need to get the attention of the teacher by using their name, that's another reason why you need their name, and perhaps engaging with them, asking them if they could help you, or asking them perhaps if you're having a, a question and answer series, then you could ask them the question that you've just asked the children. Just bring them back in again to make sure that they put down what they're doing and come and help you. This doesn't usually happen in libraries because the children will bring an adult with them. When, with the library that I work with the most, in fact all of the libraries on the Isle of Wight, anybody under eight has to have um, an adult with them. In fact the children are quite often a bit more reserved because they don't generally know each other. So they're not going to be calling out and kind of you know, being as relaxed as they are with their school friends. Once I had a really quiet group of about 12 or 15 children. None of them were saying anything, apart from this one dear little boy in the front row who had so much to say. And I was really grateful for him because he was someone that I could feed back to and then sort of like bring in some of the other children. But the unfortunate thing was his gran who was with him, sitting in a row of chairs sort of kind of behind where the children were sitting on the floor, kept saying, shh, 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 don't shh, shh. The worst thing you can think of is to have a group of children who are not saying anything. <sighs> you might find yourself getting nervous before you start. That's okay, it is completely normal. But do remember that you're not about to perform brain surgery, you are reading the book that you wrote. The reason we get nervous is because we don't know how things are going to unfold. But the one thing that you do know, and that you can be confident in it, is that you know your book. You know what happens in it, you know how it begins, you know what the middle is, you know what the end is. One thing that I never thought I would do when I first started out was hold an assembly. The first time I did it, I thought I was gonna whip myself and be sick all at the same time. Not a great look. What happened, kind of unintentionally, was that as the children filed in and the littlest ones sat at the front, I went and started having a little chat with them. And because the four and five year olds are, don't have that kind of social anxiety of speaking out, it was really easy to converse with them and ask them, you know, what they've been doing and what did they have for lunch and stuff like that. And it kind of gave me a little tribe of children that I could rely on then. So that when I started doing the assembly itself and reading my story and asking questions, I knew that at least those children would engage. As it turns out, all of them did, it was absolutely fine because when you go into a school, you are something new and something different for the day. So children are gonna want to listen to see what you're gonna say. And if it's funny or useful or interesting, they will definitely stay with you. Another tip is to remember to breathe. Now, I know this sounds a bit strange, but when I first started, I used to get really dizzy when I was you know, in front of an assembly or in front of a large group of children in a hall. I used to get really dizzy, and then my words would start coming out really, really fast, and I couldn't It's because I wasn't breathing. In fact, breathing is why punctuation is in your work. That's what it's there for, to breathe. So use it, slow down, speak clearly, breathe. You need to consider how to end your session. You can end it with reminding them which book you've read and um, what happened in it. You can thank them for coming or for letting you come to their school. Thank the teacher or the librarian and tell them how beautifully they sat and listened, even if it's stretching the truth just a little bit. Don't forget to give out any promo that you have, that's leaflets or bookmarks or anything with your website or social media on. If you've got children yourself, you know what happens. At the end of the day, you go to pick them up and you say, what did you do at school today? And they say, uh, nothing. Make sure they know you've been. If you're a new author, I'm sure that some of these tips will be really useful to you. I really wish I'd had this when I first started, so I really hope that you can put some of these things into practice. If you want to join my ever-expanding group of students on my course, then hop on the link that I will put in the description box below. It gives loads of great advice on how to get started, what key decisions you need to make, how to make a dummy book, all of the tech stuff, and how to illustrate it if you want to. Next week we'll be looking at what a story shape is, how it works, and why it will be useful to you. I'm off to have a pillow fight with myself. I will see you next week. Nanu nanu!